Thank you for listening to this forum podcast. Please check out our website for a rich archive of podcasts and writing from contemporary philosophers and other researchers on a wide variety of topics. The Forum is an educational charity dedicated to bringing academic philosophy to a broader audience. Please consider donating to us via our Just Giving page, which you can find on our website. Happy listening. Hello, welcome. Um, My name is Danielle Sands and I'm a fellow at the Forum and I'm going to be chairing this event um, in which our four speakers will all be thinking about apocalypse. Um, So the format of the event is that each speaker will have about 10 minutes. I think it's all right, yeah. We'll have about 10 minutes to address the topic and then there'll be lots of time for discussion amongst the panel and then for audience questions. Uh, So let me introduce this this evening's speakers. Um, So first of all, Professor John Milbank, who is Emeritus Professor of Religion, Politics and Ethics at the University of Nottingham. Dr. Florian Musnuk, who is reader in Italian and Comparative Literature at UCL. Dr. Suzanne Hobson, who is Senior Lecturer in 20th Century Literature at Queen Mary University of London. And finally, Dr. Franklin Ginn, who is Lecturer in Cultural Geography at the University of Bristol. And our first speaker this evening is Professor John Milbank. Thank you very much indeed. Well, it's um, a great pleasure to, to, to be here. Um, I'm not sure I'm totally sure what apocalyptic and politics is supposed to be about, but that seems appropriate as uh, 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 apocalypse is certainly um, to do with mystery. Um, now, um, we've just had the appalling uh, event of the Manchester bombings and uh, similar bombings, killing of children in Egypt, Um, And one could see these as being performed by people who have, in a certain way, an apocalyptic mindset. Um, A cleansing violence will um, prepare the way for the coming of a divine order. And we tend to think of that as completely different to um, our own understanding of things, our secular understanding of things. Well, I would like to argue to the contrary that our entire Western tradition is completely imbued with apocalyptic and we can't very readily um, escape from it. Obviously, the idea of apocalyptic comes from the Bible and it seems to have roughly three components. The idea of going beyond prophecy to a a vision of the very interior life um, of God and the heavens. Secondly, the idea that somehow in a future time, this heaven is going to come to earth. There's going to be an end of the world with the descent of the city of God into this world. But the third element is that that may well be preceded by some kind of conflict um, that may be violent. Now, is that just the Bible? Is that just the Jews? No. A lot of people have pointed out that there's something rather parallel in the case of Greece. That in the case of both Greece and Israel, you've got small countries reacting against universal, brutal empire. Empires that are including lots of different cultures and bound together only by force. It's the beginning of globalization. Apocalyptic has got a lot to do with globalization. In the face of this globalization, if you like, you invent a kind of counter-universality, an ideal universality. Um, You either have the idea of escaping to a heavenly realm, or you have the idea that an alternative divine order is going to descend into this realm. Not just then our spiritual legacy, but the very beginning of Western reason is to do with this. The idea that to Socrates a kind of divine revelation has occurred, that we're now embarking upon a new age of the rule of the Logos. Thus Plato articulates at least two visions of new ideal cities to come in the future. The parallels to the Hebrew situation are very strong. But in either situation, there is caution. There is a sense that you can only roughly anticipate um, this divine realm. It's expressed in remote symbols. You you haven't got a complete grasp of it. It's, It's all a bit of a mystery. 
And that caution is compounded in the New Testament legacy where a very strange thing happens. The claim that the end of the world has already arrived, but in the form of somebody proclaiming the truth and being executed and apparently losing. So that the very last bit of the Bible, book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, or the apocalyptic, is a strange amalgam of this vision of uh, the suffering, loving, forgiving person, and the final struggle between that and evil. And this mutates the idea of apocalyptic. Um, and, and that mutation is continued in the idea that, to some extent, uh, through the existence of the church, just as through the existence of philosophy and the coming of sort of constitutional, go constitutional government, we can kind of remotely approach this final end if we can't quite get there. Now, further down the line in Western history, and I can't go into that in great detail, you get various stronger apocalyptic movements, particularly associated with people like Joachim of Fure, that sort of reinstate the idea that there's going to be a huge rupture, there's going to be a huge break um, coming along. And to fast forward very rapidly, the strange thing is that when you get secularization, this looks like a secularization of apocalyptic, in a sense, because apocalypse has this idea of a descent of the divine and the, and the perfect. It's kind of ready-made almost to be secularized. So the extraordinary thing is that apocalyptic has continued in a much more secular mode. You've had the Enlightenment, you've had the French Revolution, um, and again, that's an attempt to sort of infuse an empire with an ideal order. After the French Revolution, you get Napoleon. And sure enough, there is accompanying violence. There is terror, almost uncannily. This seems to echo um, these religious thematics, even though religious, the power of religion seems to be dwindling. Then we have the Russian Revolution as well. But can we be so sure that even our sort of more moderate Western liberalism is free of this um, apocalyptic tenor? Um, I don't really think we can. We've, we've got the idea that we already know the final answer in some sense. The final answer is liberalism, democracy, and human rights. And we simply have to convert the world to that. And if you like, our apocalyptic program is to do just that. And another part of that program is that all that we will share in common, if you like, um, is the increasing control of nature. And in many ways, because liberalism, capitalism, democracy rights never resolves all the problems, the real problems of conflict, especially between the rich and the poor, but also between different cultural ideals, it has to unite people by this project of unending um, economic growth and dominance of nature. And that, if you like, is an apocalyptic program itself, which, of course, then gives rise to um, a much more acute apocalyptic fear that that in itself is actually leading us into disaster. Now, what I would finally want to suggest to you as a controversial thesis is that secular apocalyptic is just as dangerous as the most violent religious apocalyptic, and that, in fact, a more moderate apocalyptic, which, in a sense, we're doomed to because of our Western legacy, has to take something like a religious form. Because it's only when it takes religious form that you modify your claims about finality. You may have some remote intuitions about the, what the good is. You may have a series of symbols for it. But you don't turn it into a kind of ideological package. You have more sense that it is to come in the future. You don't need to have um, the whole answer now. And similarly, I think by losing um, the, the religious dimension to apocalyptic, we've lost the idea that our relationship to nature um, is about trying to beautify the world. It's about trying to 
introduce a more harmonious relationship between human beings and nature. It's about um, a project of overcoming illness and death that's not about destroying the world. You can even see this present, despite the rude things people say about him, in Francis Bacon. And in a sense, it's only when that project becomes completely secularized that it becomes totally brutal and we lose that sense that somehow we, we can sort of transfigure the world, if you like. We can cause the world to um, become, become more illuminated by beauty in, in an anticipation um, of what religious people think of um, as the eschaton. So that would finally be my thesis, that equally dangerous are extreme religious apocalyptics that totally despair of the present, that make far too strong claims about the final answer, and secular things um, that go in the same way, but that it's only religious modes of apocalyptic that offer you that mediation of the end, that caution and reserve about the end that is absolutely essential if we're not to destroy ourselves. Thank you. Florian? Right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's fascinating to listen to this trajectory and uh, I'm very grateful uh, to you, John, for having outlined the, the history of this extremely powerful philosophy of time and philosophy of, of progress and um, I, I'll be more prosaic I'm a, a literature scholar I work primarily on novels which represent um, global catastrophe and which are narratives of survival either survival of individuals or survival of small groups um, these are very often uh, labelled as apocalypse fiction um, we can have a discussion about whether this is actually an appropriate label. I think that's an interesting question to be asked. But uh, This is to do with the uh, process of secularization of the apocalyptic, which we've been um, hearing about. Um, one, uh, so I've read about, I uh, must have read about sort of 300, 350 of these. Obviously, you begin to get a sense that sort of the end of time <laughs> comes closer and closer and things are not all that good. But you also get a sense of how each, each period um, um, transforms recurrent topoi and recurrent uh, plot structures uh, for its own benefit. So I, what I wanted to say, just a sort of few words uh, today, is um, how I... Um, um, how, how I want to sort of think of this um, particular tradition of writing as a literary genre, what it means to see it as a literary genre, and once we start thinking about it as a literary genre, whether we can then still see these patterns of continuity with religious thought, with religious tradition. Um, so um, novels, um, apocalyptic novels for the purpose of my argument, are novels which are set in the future, um, um, but which are written as narratives proper, so they're not prophecies. So obviously the tradition of prophetic writing is as old as, as, the, as human culture itself, but the tradition of sort of actually having something which reads like a novel um, set in the future, um, that's surprisingly recent. Right? It's a, um, a, a fiction which describes uh, John's first-person experience with all the kind of sort of um, tricks and tropes that you'd associate with with a, na with a, with, with a properly plotted novel. So, so um, omniscient narrator, um, character with some degree of character psychology written in the past tense but set in the, in the near future. That only really sort of originates in the, um, in the early 19th century. Um, it's one of the um, difficulties with this whole field of study is why it comes so late. Um, it, it originates very precisely at a time at the time of the French Revolution and in the context of secularization of apocalyptic narratives. So one of the first novels called The Last Man uh, is actually an attempt to, by a French lapsed Catholic priest um, called um, Cousin de Granville, is actually a description of apocalypse as experienced by a fictional character, Omegaris. Um, in some sort of uh, remote future um, um, of a recognizable, but only barely recognizable remote future France, right? Um, 
So um, there is a sense of sort of thematic continuity. There is a sense of sort of certainly, um, shall I say, rhetorical continuity. Um, what many of these fictions evoke, and I would say what they evoke similarly to the religious tradition um, that, of course, um, uh, enables them and precedes them, is a sense of urgency. Um, is a sense of um, um, perhaps of, um, of, of a strong moral demand as well associated with this. You sort of you want to know whether you're at the end of times. Next, you want to know whether you're going to be with the righteous or whether you're going to be with the damned. Also, you have to act very quickly. And very importantly, what, uh, what we just heard about this sort of sense of disclosure. Apocalypse means revelation. You get that very strongly in fictional writers. Um, fictional writers very often are people like the great utopian writers are people who believe that they have understood um, the, the, the inner workings of society. They will use this apocalyptic plot to present a blueprint of a better or worse society. Right? Sort of, um, everything will become clear. Often everything will become clear as a process of decoding. Right? The sort of many of these novels are um, uh, conspiracy novels of kinds. Right? You sort of you understand this is again something which is very important to the apocalyptic tradition. You 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 have to the apocalyptic tradition is a symbolic tradition, and you have to sort of learn to read it properly. You have to recognize Antichrist when mm -hmm. Antichrist walks into this room. Right. Yes. Um, the, um, so um, there is a sense of continuity, um, but of course that, um, that sense of, of continuity or that idea of a, sort of con of a genre that develops um, is actually um, problematic as well for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, I would say that the vast majority of apocalypse novels are not actually really in any meaningful sense about the end of the world. Um, a lot of them, the vast majority about the kind of sort of um, uh, they're sort of, um, how should I say, social contract narratives or sort of maybe neo-Edenic narratives. So they're either about a small community of people who gather and they manage to sort of found a new small city and they survive or they're about sort of um, um, Adam, every man meeting Eve, a uh, beautiful young girl and they have children together and they survive. This is what the science fiction writer Brian Aldiss called the cozy catastrophe. Right, you um, you're the last. You think you're the last man. You walk through the ruins of um, apocalyptic London. You suddenly meet this beautiful woman. You spend a little bit of time having uh, drinking champagne in a Mayfair apartment, and then you go off into the countryside and you start civilization again. And, uh, you know, this is um, so. Not many of these are not really sort of. Many of these are sort of politically, ideologically very reactionary. Um, novels, which sort of, uh, many of them are sort of at the uh, psychological level, I would say, are wish fulfillment fantasies. Um, it, throughout the 20th century, the vast majority of people writing these, and indeed also in the 19th century, are men, um, male authors writing about male characters. And this shifts radically and maybe. Are you going to sort of this and you're nodding uh, in the 21st century? I mean, we now have a, this is a very exciting moment uh, for the genre because we have a predominant, uh, predominantly female um, um, community of authors writing um, dystopian and apocalyptic fictions with female characters. Um, the, um, so the idea of a genre is, is problematic, um, perhaps because very few of the novels labeled apocalyptic are actually sort of in that most profound and meaningful sense that we heard about invested in a sort of uh, a radical sense of sort of uncertainty and, and desire to sort of understand the future. Um, the other reason why it's problematic to, 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 to think about this as a codified genre is because um, there is very little sense of self-awareness. Um, it appears that certainly it, for a long time, it was the case that people who wrote novels of this kind wrote them in isolation, often wrote them without any sort of awareness of other people having written similar novels. You know, sort of, it appears that many of them were perhaps haunted by this sort of profound fear that they might one day find themselves waking up and sort of discovering that they're the last man on earth and that they think this is actually a great plot. 
that very often some of them are sort of um, um, established in well-known writers, but very many of the people who write in this tradition are actually sort of eccentrics, maverick writers, and sort of. So there is a sort of there is not a, if you compare it to something like, for example, the, the tradition of detective fiction, or even the um, uh, the, the tradition of, of sort of utopian writing um, proper. There is there's sort of for a long time much less of a sense of sort of genre awareness. So, um, but the final point I wanted to make um, in relation to this is um, uh, cultural historians, especially cultural historians working on the, on the Cold War era, have shown, there's a person who's written extensively about this called Paul Boyer, who's shown that apocalyptic anxiety um, um, is manifest in sort of certain particular historical moments and it peaks and um, the kind of sort of anxiety around sort of um, existential threat then generates a lot of cultural interest. So you can sort of almost map um, a particular interest in apocalyptic novels onto the kind of sort of more general debates. And he's done that, Paul Boy has done that for the Cold War period um, and has identified four peak periods between 1945 and 1989. I think you could probably sort of pursue this into the present and you would probably find, I haven't done this kind of uh, research, but you'd probably find that we're in the moment of sort of peak apocalyptic anxiety at the moment. It seems to be sort of surrounding us. Now, one of the interesting questions for me in relation to this idea of sort of apocalypse literature as a genre that spans religious and secular writing is that um, when you start reading a large number of works which are concerned with the possibility of sort of um, of an imminent catastrophe, right? um, existential threat, um, and you realize and you begin to understand that each of them in their own cultural period conveys that strong sense of urgency. Um, so the 1945, people were sort of notoriously sort of demanding a literature which would alert people to the threats of the atomic age. Um, now we, we experience this kind of sort of demand for authors um, who alert us to the threats of climate change. Um, the, the continuity of tropes and the continuity of, um, of a particular kind of sort of um, apocalyptic rhetoric actually seems to work against this um, political demand on some level. So if, when, you, when you begin to understand this as a historical genre developing over time, and when you see it, especially if you see it sort of in relation to its religious precursors, um, you, you tend to sort of lose sight of the, ap- of the sort of this extreme sense of urgency that seems to be characteristic of the genre. Um, so um, In a sense, my feeling is that sort of understanding it and sort of mapping it as a genre um, fails to capture what is most distinctive of any apocalyptic tradition, which is this sort of sense that it's profoundly rooted and has to be rooted in our cultural present, in our generation, in our sort of in our personal in our personal experience. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. Okay, um, I'm going to sort of frame my talk around a few images, um, which is why I'm standing here. I'm also a literary scholar, but I'm going to come at this from a different angle to Florian. Um, I want to look at some of the ways in which the apocalypse and apocalyptic angels in particular are sort of repurposed over the course of the first half of the 20th century to signify what authors then thought, um, although I take Florian's point about there's always a sense of urgency to apocalyptic thinking, but what the authors of these particular texts and the artists thought was a quintessentially modern predicament. The idea that progress, especially technological progress, had not liberated humankind but had brought it instead to the brink of catastrophe. So a sort of perverse outcome to what's understood to be an enlightenment or rationalist ideal. And I think one of the reasons this has a lot of currency in the early 20th century is that there's a pretty irresistible analogy to be made between the war in heaven 
um, and the experience and anticipation of total war, by which I mean the expansion of war beyond the battlefield to impact directly on civilians, whether we're talking about total mobilisation conscription in World War I, um, new techniques of propaganda, or indeed... Um, aerial warfare. And this is really where the analogy seems irresistible. As you can see from the quotes above, we have both D.H. Lawrence here and H.G. Wells calling on Milton and War in Heaven to understand the appearance of zeppelins in the sky above London in the First World War. The last quote is from Wyndham Lewis, and he's comparing the Blitz really to, how does he put it, a terrific struggle between the Archangel Michael and Satan. Now, I think the reference to Milton here is important because, of course, the 20th century did not invent the idea of total war. It was imagined previous to that. And what Lawrence is doing here is kind of seizing on Milton, that imagined total war, and using it to explicate events in the present. And, of course, the First World War is not war in heaven any more than that was a sort of reality in Milton's time. I'll come back to this this question of imagined and real apocalypse right at the end. There is, though, I think in this period, a kind of imperative to think cosmically in order to apprehend what's seen as the full scale of war. And here I'm going to refer to a philosopher, Walter Benjamin, who has a quote that I I find very helpful on this subject. He says, It's a dangerous error of modern man to dismiss such cosmic thinking as the concern only of the ancients or of poets. He says, It's not. It's our strikes again and again, and then neither nations nor generations can escape it. It was made terribly clear, he says, by the last war, which was an attempt at new and unprecedented co-mingling with the cosmic powers. Okay, so there's an imperative to think on this grand scale, Benjamin thinks. Okay, so my first kind of example of an angel heralding a sort of crisis, a sort of crisis of modernity, is Paul Clay's Angelus Novus. Now, Walter Benjamin, the philosopher I mentioned before, acquired this picture in 1921, and he gave it the name under which it is pretty much better now, I think, known. He called it, in his 1940 thesis on the philosophy of history, he called it the angel of history. And he said, this angel is looking out in horror at the past, and what he sees in the past is one single catastrophe that keeps piling up ruins. This angel, Benjamin said, would like to stop history. He'd like to arrest time and put right the damage that has already been done. But he's prevented from doing so by a storm which is blowing the angel backwards. So you have to imagine him sort of being blown backwards from the past into the future. Now we, um, we, says Benjamin, get it wrong when we think of this storm that's blowing us from the past into the future as progress. And what Benjamin has in his sights here is a kind of historical conformism, which equates um, technological process, uh, with, sorry, technological advancement with liberation, emancipation, and improvement in social relations. This is not what happens. What happens, Benjamin suggests, progress brings with it social regression. He's coming from a Marxist point of view, of course. Quick footnote to this angel to kind of continue my tour through apocalyptic 20th century angel. Paul Clay, in fact, um, produced over 50 line angel drawings in his career, including a huge series of 28 in 1939 on the eve of war, the year before his death. Uh, These are two of my favourites. This one is called weirdly angel still female and the one on the right again kind of using that trope of war in heaven is called the angelus militans now these angels have a kind of sense of watchfulness about them but in their dissembled bodies and blank expressions they seem rather bewildered not attentive not watching over us they seem rather lost perhaps like the creatures they're supposed to be guarding okay next 20th century apocalyptic thinker. (laughs) D.H. Lawrence, someone much better known for his novels than his paintings, but I like this painting. 
um, sorry, it's quite hard to see, but I'll try and point the relevant bits out to you. Um, this painting, I think, encapsulates some of his kind of philosophy. What you see here on the left is his representation of industry. So we've got chimneys, factory chimneys, and we've got something that looks a bit like an electricity substation with cables kind of crawling out and wrapping themselves around the figures. The figures themselves are on, in the middle of the picture. That's Adam, um, and he's fighting, battling with the angel at the gates of paradise to gain re-entry to Eden, to paradise. On the, you can't quite see it here, but there's a sort of Eve in the corner, sort of slipping around the edge to get, to get back in before Adam. <laughs> okay, now this is the kind of apocalyptic um, vision that you see as well in Lawrence's fiction at the end of The Rainbow, for example, where Ursula looks out and she sees the sort of spread of um, corrupt industry and urbanisation over the landscape, and she looks ahead and sees a rainbow and heralds the new world. Now, I don't think that Lawrence is someone who thought we could just retreat from modernity, that we could go back to a kind of prelapsarian or innocent past. More often, he sort of delves back into these sometimes Christian, sometimes pre-Christian traditions in order to see how, like Benjamin, history might have developed down a different track. <coughs> Okay, coming to my last example. Um, I don't have a picture for this one, but I wanted to include her because I think she does something quite different with her apocalyptic angels. And that's the poet H.D., which is short for Hilda Doolittle. Um, now, she was friends with Lawrence for part of her life, and she shared his sense that the enemy of the times was, in her words, the great overwhelming mechanical demon, the devil of machinery, of which we can hardly repeat too often, um, the war is the hideous offspring. Now, the poem for which she's best known is Trilogy, and this is a Second World War epic, a bit like T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets, but much less well known. Um, and what she does in this poem, it has three sections. The first section is about the sort of Resilience of people living in London during the Blitz. She, she lived in the city and worked throughout the Blitz. Um, and she, in the first part of that poem, she kind of describes houses, part destroyed, but lives continuing all the same. The second part of the poem, which is what interests me here, she invokes a series of angels by name. And their appearance, the appearance of these angels, heralds the transition from one astrological eon to the next, from the age of Pisces to the age of Aquarius. And H.G. wrote very often in her letters of this time of the Second World War as the last gasp of the previous age. And following the example of the astrologers, she looked forward to Aquarius as a woman's age. Um, it's very difficult to do this without singing the song from her, you know, the age of Aquarius. But she's sort of tapping into the same kind of new age ideas here. Now, there are lots of examples I could have considered here, um, such as um, coming slightly, well, around about the same time as HD, J.F. Hendry and Henry Treese's New Apocalypse Anthology from 1939. And this was a collection of poems um, by people such as Herbert Reed, Michael Roberts. And in the introduction to this, this collection, Hendry pays kind of particular tribute to his apocalyptic predecessors, D.H. Lawrence, Wyndham Lewis, who have both come up. He said they, they had the problem right. They saw the terrible outcome of the machine-made logic, but they could only withdraw. Instead of taking this head-on, Lawrence withdrew into sex, and Wyndham Lewis withdrew into pessimism. Now, I think this kind of constant sort of picking up, if you like, on the apocalyptic imagery of a previous generation is very interesting. And I also think it might give us a possible answer to one of the questions posed in the seminar blurb. Why the apocalypse? Why now? And I suggest that literary apocalypses often confirm, retrospectively, an anticipatory sense of the future as foreclosed. 
Okay, so Lawrence calls on Milton in order to say, we've come to the end of the world, <laughs> finally. And then Henry calls on Lawrence to say, oh, we've come to the end of the world. And we now look, I think, sometimes to Lawrence, sometimes even to HD, but even more often to Walter Benjamin for our own sense of a kind of um, future that is going to be foreclosed, that is going to be cut off, um, to express our own humanitarian and environmental crises. So this is my speculation, in a way, that the literature of apocalypse is always relevant because it's always ahead of itself in predicting a catastrophe that is yet to come and will never, in this form, or at least never arrive and will live to tell the tale. Okay, thank you. So last August, the Anthropocene Working Group, a subset of the Geological Society of London, voted overwhelmingly, there was one abstention, but it's not a democracy, so it doesn't matter, voted overwhelmingly that one, the Anthropocene, the age of humanity in which we have become a planetary force on a geological scale, that this was both stratigraphically real and that it should be formalized as a new geological epoch. Oh, of course, it's slightly too late because I think the, the kind of horse has already bolted from the stable door of geoscience and that for the scientists to try and hold on to and arbitrate whether we are or are not in the Anthropocene is kind of missing the point because the Anthropocene has become an enormously productive concept in a whole range of disciplines. And I think the Anthropocene, undoubtedly, it's a terrible, terrible name, uh, but it's what we've got and we'll stick with it. There are many other names probably far more appropriate, capitalist Donna Haraway's Thulu scene. But for me, the question of the Anthropocene is, as I like Isabel Stengers, the way she puts it, as the, it represents the intrusion of Gaia into planetary history. And when she says Gaia, don't think about James Lovelock's kind of self-regulating machine. Uh, for her, Gaia is a, a, a kind of bitchy goddess although, again, I think you would probably want a, a gender-neutral deity, uh, but one which is, uh, to quote fundamentally, a ticklish assemblage of forces that are, crucially, this indifferent to our reasons and our projects. So the Anthropocene represents the intrusion of planetary history and planetary-scale Earth processes into human history, and conversely, the imposition of human history onto Earth, planetary Earth forces. One of the questions for Stengers and others interested in the Anthropocene is how one might feel Gaia, how one might come to know this ticklish goddess uh, and what we how we might respond uh, to our current uh, predicament, which is, I think, where uh, the recent uh, sort of upswing in apocalyptic thinking comes in. I think apocalypse is a way to both, is a, both a product of contemporary Anthropocene concerns and also produces in turn uh, a generalized culture of anxiety about the prospects for human survival. And I'm particularly interested in what I want to talk a little bit about in this talk, mainly through some examples, uh, is the anthropocentrism of current incarnations of apocalypse. As was mentioned before, we can probably draw uh, something of a rough and ready kind of guide to modern environmental apocalypse, which might begin in the sort of uh, mid point of the 20th century with nightmares of depletion, uh, thinking of Silent Spring, films like Soylent Green and so on. And these, these aren't sort of genres in a sequence. These are more like geological strata laid down on top of each other, which inform each other and are deformed through the layering. So the, the sort of nightmares of depletion leading to the 1980s rise in dystopian cyberpunk, things like Blade Runner or William Gibson's Neuromancer, which are much more about a kind of uh, libertarian cyborg freeing up um, of uh, a social Darwinist view of living amid nightmares of hyperabundance. Through the kind of uh, 1990s optimistic can-do uh, environmental apocalypse in which, yes, there are a whole set of environmental risks, but fundamentally they are manageable. 
and I think this, as was mentioned earlier, this fundamentally reflects the political culture at the time, and not only that, also reflects the kind of understanding of global climate change, which was around in the 1990s, which was that this is a planetary scale problem but is manageable within existing governance structures, uh, a realization which no longer holds, of course. I think of uh, the kind of epitome of these 1990s uh, can-do films or the, the, the series of terrible asteroid films, which either have Morgan Freeman going set to DEFCON 1 or Bruce Willis jetting off uh, to blow up an asteroid before it hits Earth. So despite the radicality or the potential apocalyptic impact of the asteroids, they are yet manageable within existing techno-scientific governance regimes. And the most recent kind of layering of this, apocaly this apocalyptic fiction is, I would argue, the post-apocalyptic, which is less of a question of urgency and is more a question of living on in the slow unraveling of life after the apocalypse has happened, with a kind of passivity, a kind of uh, recognition that apocalypse is inevitable and all we can do is simply work out how to affirm what life might look like uh, in a state... Uh, which has been shorn of social contracts, shorn of the, any kind of state apparatus, uh, shorn of any existing ethics or morality. And what I'm particularly interested in, and I'm just going to whiz through some examples in the time that's remaining, is how the, this post-apocalyptic genre reveals the multi-species entanglements of humans with others. So it's not that humans exist uh, only in this apocalyptic realm. Apocalypse is not a kind of a green arithmetic or a ping-pong match between culture and nature, but is a fundamentally entangled phenomenon. And where else could we begin but with... I uh, can't see that at all. Which is probably quite... Is there any way we can dim the... Uh, these are just some film stills. They're all very dark, as <laughs> you would expect. Anyway, where else could one begin talking about post-apocalypse than The Road, uh, both the book and the film? Uh, the Road, the film, opens with the man telling us that each day is more grey than the one before. It is cold and getting colder. The earth is slowly dying. No animals have survived, and all the crops are long gone. Soon all the trees in the world will fall, which turns out to be false. There are two key animals. I mean, there's, there is still something left to say about The Road, I think, although it's been done to death. But the two key creatures which appear in the road are firstly this. You can't quite see it. This is a little sort of uh, tin which the boy finds which has a bug inside it. And then you can sort of see... This is kind of like what the film is like, I guess. Uh, you can sort of see here maybe the little bug flies away when the boy opens the tin, which is a kind of nice uh, inver inversion of the boy as bug collector. Uh, instead of capturing the bug uh, and keeping it, he finds the bug and sets it free. On the one hand, this could be seen as some kind of attempt to uh, recoup some possibility for redemption, that not all animals die, that life does continue struggling on towards its own precarious kind of future. But of course, actually, the bug will surely die too. I think what it does is, in fact, heighten uh, the, feel the feeling of loss showing the character in the film, recognizing belatedly that it's the absence of non-human others which limit their powers, their own possibilities of becoming with. They're robbed of kind of allies in recuperating the earth after apocalyptic meltdown. You can see this one a little more clearly. Uh, this is, of course, uh, the dog, uh, which plays a... Oh, there we go. Uh, which plays a, a key role... Oh, it's very dark. Which plays a key role... Uh, <laughs> In, when the, the boy and the man are sheltering in a, the um, kind of uh, apocalyptic bin that they find and the dog sniffs them out and then right at the end this is the sort of final scene on the beach with the boy coming across Guy Pearce and others no I can't read my notes uh, <laughs> but, but the, the, this is when the boy meets oh there we go this is when the boy meets this, this group on the beach and uh, the dog's kind of beguiling face, I think, here actually disguises its role as a, a its new role as a laborer in the emerging farming economy of the road, herding not sheep, but sniffing out young humans. They've got the boy becoming meat for Guy Pierce's beach barbecue, uh, dog the cannibal's best friend. 
Uh, the Life of Pi is another classic example here of the limits of non-human friendship in which Pi uh, finds himself after a uh, disaster on his life zoo, zoo arc, uh, marooned in a lifeboat with a tiger. I've included this as a sort of CGI, you know, the, the dummy which was used in the film rather than the full CGI um, incarnation because I think that kind of speaks quite nicely to the virtuality of non-human presence in a lot of uh, debates about the Anthropocene. Anyway, at the end, uh, when they finally beach on this island, the tiger, uh, called Richard Parker, simply wanders off. This is having spent an hour uh, of, the two of the two, the human and the tiger, getting to know each other, reaching a certain kind of accommodation, building perhaps even a certain form of friendship. But fundamentally, the tiger uh, turns his back on the human and says, well, I was just using you all along. And I think this shows the kind of limits of non-human friendship. The next... Well, two more examples. The next is, of course, Melancholia. And these are all classic touchstones of recent apocalyptic cinema. Melancholia, the, the film about a cosmic annihilation where the, the huge planetoid Melancholia appears from the cosmic depths to come and shatter the Earth. The reading of this film is generally uh, that it's a, a kind of post-political, uh, the rich partying as the world comes to an end. But, of course, in the film, it's Justine who suffers from uh, depression, who is the one who it turns out to be best equipped to deal with the cosmic apocalypse. John, the kind of rational science hero figure in the film, ends up committing suicide when he realizes that all his uh, scientific know-how uh, has come to nothing and that the apocalypse will arrive. But the key scene for me here is, again, one which involves the non-human. This is uh, towards the end, the second part of the film, where Justine and her sister Claire get on these horses and ride. This is a kind of wonderful affirmative scene. This is them sort of, they get together and there's a lot of energy, uh, unlike the rest of the film, which is a lot of sitting around. And for me, of course, the, the film begins with the end and the planet's destruction, and the film also ends with the end of the planet destruction. So it's kind of on a loop. But for me, the, what, it's the kind of uh, the irreducible, irrepressible energy of this scene indicates to me that there is perhaps possibly a way out for the characters. If only, if we reran this film again and again and again within its film world, it might turn out differently. If only the horses can run fast enough and can keep running, then they might escape the planetary catastrophe. The horse here, for me, represents a potential line of flight or a potential escape from planetary apocalypse. And then the final film, uh, which is, again features a horse. Uh, this is The Turin Horse by Bellatar, 2011, an absolutely fantastic film, which begins uh, with a recounting of the perhaps apocryphal tale of Nietzsche uh, coming out of, the, uh, of his house door in Turin and seeing a horse being whipped and throwing himself uh, between the whip and the horse and, and then he goes home and sort of lies back in his couch and never writes again. And the film opens with, we know what happened to Nietzsche, we don't know what happened to the horse. And then there's a five minute uh, long clip of the horse going back to the farm. Uh, this film uh, really uh, plays with temporality, uh, it really stretches it out. One a, a sort of useful way of understanding this is that the average Hollywood film has a jump cut every five seconds and the Turin horse has a cut every six minutes. So it's a glacially slow uh, film. But what I'm interested in here particularly is on day two, this horse which is in its shed refuses to eat and it refuses to drink, it refuses to work no matter how hard uh, the man beats it. On day four, uh, as the, the, the man and the daughter, the central protagonists of the film, attempt to escape uh, the, the gloomy, the, the, the setup of the movie is a sort of anti-Genesis narrative of seven days into, into decline uh, with the wind, uh, there's a sudden darkness descends until right at the very end of the film, uh, life is extinguished. But on day four, uh, the couple attempt to flee with their horse. And this is where they're fleeing. They go over the horizon. The camera lingers for two or three minutes, which is a very long time to look at a tree on a hill. Uh, but they return back even more weary and destitute than they were when they set out. 
the horse is shut away in its stable and is never seen again. Uh, this is the final film of the scene, which is, again, very dark. After all light has been extinguished, um, the uh, pair are reduced to clawing uh, raw potatoes uh, for some kind of sustenance. So the horse, again, represents and the only possibility that this pair have to break out of what is called the law of wind and misery, the eternal repetition of their everyday routines. The film repeats time and time and time again their morning and evening routines. So again, it's the horse. So, I mean, what I would suggest that just these brief snippets, we can see animals doing something extremely interesting in apocalyptic film, and I think what they're doing is revealing that lines of alliance Cross, cut across species lines in uh, apocalyptic representations at the moment. Animals saving, animals betraying, as well as being annihilated. And I think what's particularly key is that you have a, you have a slow unraveling of the entangled lifelines of humans and their non-human companions, which is post-apocalypse. And I'll leave it there. So I was interested in this idea of representa representations of the apocalypse, which seem to come up in all three of your talks, and a little bit, I think, gestured by you, John, as well, um, that there seems to be a real desire to represent the apocalypse in some way. Florian, you mentioned the sheer volume of apocalyptic fiction. Um, but is it something that is just destined to failure and therefore useless? Um, is it something that inevitably domesticates something which is unrepresentable, really? Um, or is it something that is actually useful? Or is that, how does that tension play out? Um, I think that's a very good question, and it allows me to reference um, one of my favourite critics, um, Frank Kermode. He wrote in a very famous book called Sense of an Ending that we all want a Concord fiction. We want a fiction of the end. It gives us a sense of meaning to life. Even if that end might be apocalyptic, we can kind of understand how our presence is in relation to an end. And then he sort of... The problem, he said, with certain versions of a kind of apocalypse or a concord fiction is that they then sort of... They become something akin to a myth in that they're a sort of fiction that we believe in, <laughs> that they're a lie that, that we, we then believe in. And he sort of, he sort of moved away from this idea as being um, unhelpful um, in terms of understanding what we want from fiction and also political, because there's a notion that we're being deceived by these Concord fictions into thinking everything will be all right in the end, okay? You know, there will be a, a new world. Um, and he later said in 2000, reflecting on his book, which was written in 1968, that perhaps that wasn't the correct way to think about them. But I do think there's nonetheless something very powerful in that idea of understanding our lives, as Camus said, in the middle, <laughs> in relation to some kind of final, final meaning. I, yeah, I mean, I, I would suggest, though, that really apocalyptic just doesn't exist without representation, because... The, the idea of the end of the world is, 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 is a fiction. It certainly was in, in the ancient world, and maybe we now know the sun will burn out, but you know, the universe will, physical reality will come on, you know, carry on. You know, the, the idea of an end is a specifically kind of philosophical or theological or mythical invention. Uh, you know, we're only conceiving of an end at all because we're representing it. And so it, it's, it's the images themselves that conjure up um, that idea. And I was very struck, actually, in the last talk, when you were talking about animals, because, of course, animals figure big time in the apocalyptics of the Bible. You know, there are all these strange images of, of, of beasts and, you know, lions and, and the Lamb of God and, and so on. And, and precisely, if you like, an intimation that the divine is kind of beyond, um, you, know, you know, both the human and, and the bestial, which I think is, um, is, is interesting. I think there's a tension. Um, a representation is a very interesting... Uh, thing to look at because I think there is a, 
uh, a sense that many of these fictions, in order to fulfill their political role, want to be authoritative and they want to be compelling. So you have a, a, a whole sort of range of stock characters which are very recognisable, especially in the Cold War period. You know, the, but, but, but even earlier, the, um, the scientist... Uh, the heroic soldier, you know, the sort of Bruce Willis character blowing up the, the asteroid, the, the self-sacrificing mother. Um, and, and these are figures which, uh, in order to sort of um, appeal uh, and in order to convey that sense of urgency, have to, I guess, to an extent, or at least the authors would sort of argue um, or, or seem to believe, have to act in a, in a world that is plausible. What, what goes diametrically against this, in my view, is the sort of deeper underlying sense that with the apocalyptic we're in the presence of something which is precisely mysterious which is not yet unveiled and, and, and uh, you know this is, this is for me why it's interesting this is, you know, this is for me why the sort of the, the idea of, of the supernatural is so interesting because it, it toys very much with our experience now of the Anthropocene of these, you know, um, the, the idea of, of something that exceeds our that, that affects us profoundly that but it exceeds not our comprehension, but our sense of agency. Um, okay. What Timothy Morton calls the sort of hyper objects, these things which sort of engulf us, entangle us, but which we can't control. I mean, this is sort of, we, um, I would say in, in most of the fiction, that's not really the sense that is conveyed. In most of the, I mean, there are some examples. The road is actually, I think, that, you know, the Cormac McCarthy's book is actually very, very interesting stylistically, because you sort of get that, that sense that this sort of, perennial grey and this kind of sort of world which he says is like glaucoma it's sort of dimming away from us that is sort of, that we cannot really picture it when we, when we read the book but mostly it's represented and it's represented in a way which I think goes against this sort of profound fear of the unknown um, Amitav Ghosh has an interesting essay about sort of the you know how we must move away from uh, the idea of sort of from the whole sort of I think the sort of the conventions of realism in order to tackle a climate change at all. I mean, there's a, there's an interesting exchange in, in Melancholia towards the end where uh, Justine is is talking to her sister, and Justine goes, "It doesn't matter that the world's going to be annihilated. No one is going to be there to mourn for it." Her sister replies, "Yes, but there will be life somewhere else, which will continue." And she goes, "No, there is not. There's nothing." And I think it's that that to take to the extreme is what's I think particularly resonant about contemporary post-apocalyptic Anthropocenian fictions: is this extreme cosmic pessimism, this utter uh, withdrawal, which I think speaks to the gap between ones or uh, the awareness given to us, bequeathed to us by science. Uh, and our sense of political impotence. It's interesting because I, I don't read Melancholia like that. Uh, it's a Danish film. It's a gloss on Kierkegaard. Um, the, the, because Kierkegaard says our problem, our human problem, is melancholia um, rather than um, advancing... To, we want to get back to something instead of advancing towards faith. And the very last shot of the film, they take the leap of faith. They take the Kierkegaardian leap of faith. That's what it's about. It's a, it's a profoundly Danish religious film. And I was surprised in what I felt you, in your, all your examples you were all giving of apocalyptic. It seemed to me you, you didn't mention the most major apocalyptic works, which to my mind are, first of all, Ridley Walker by Russell Hoban, um, which is this completely... This is, he is the James Joyce of apocalyptic writing because he imagines... England after a nuclear holocaust where the language has been destroyed and the book is rewritten in this sort of reinvented language which and it's a terrible book but it's also quite hopeful in the sense that the language has recovered the energy of, of Anglo-Saxon and tiny fragments of culture have survived so the myth of St Eustace who um, you know, shot a stag and then, and then saw the crucifix in the stag's horns and became a saint. And Punch and Judy shows. And out of these kind of bizarre things, they sort of recreate something like 
um, a religious vision. Now, what I think is interesting about that is that this is after a secular catastrophe, but they're going back to religion. And in a way, they don't know why the catastrophe has happened, but they're kind of reading it as a, as a spiritual disaster. And they're, and they're really kind of not wrong. <laughs> you know, the book is trying to persuade you of that. And I think a very similar thing is true uh, of the other, to my mind, really great work not mentioned, which is Tarkovsky's film Stalker. Uh, also said after a nuclear catastrophe, uh, and a similar feeling of, of, of him saying, well, at that point, you have to realise that, that, you know, this is, this is evil, and then you rediscover the good in some way. And I think, I think Cormac McCarthy also, has a slightly similar thing, is, is going on. So, yeah. Well, the end of the novel, mm. the end of the road, is, mm. is, is, is very interesting because there is the, the description... After the, you know, in a, in a final paragraph, there's the description of the crook trout, and uh, it's not quite clear what the, which is, if you wish, the third animal, and it's not quite clear where that brook trout is. If I mean, not presumably in the fictional world, but somehow in the text. And um, when I when I read this with with students, you you you, you get the most sort of extraordinarily passionate and emotional uh, reactions to this. I mean, a lot of people sort of say, you know, he'll be, the boy will be eaten, and uh, they all just sort of, which is sort of like Lady Macbeth's uh, children, you know, you don't know what happens to the boy afterwards, but some, some students will say the boy will be eaten, and this is this kind of sort of, of profound pessimism, and some people say, well, all will be well in the end, because there is the brook trout, and this, sort of, this is a kind of sort of promise of redemption outside the text, outside the fictional world, but in the text, I should say so. I mean, I think this question of redemption keeps coming up again and again. The extent yeah. to which these representations tend towards the pessimistic or they tend towards like, some kind of a redemptive recuperation and also the extent to which that is necessarily a religious recuperation mm. in mm. some sense. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, that it, it, apocalyptic is poised between... Um, those two things. It's, it's like an intensification. I mean, Augustine's gloss on the book of Revelation is that things both get worse and worse and worse as time goes on, but they also get better and better and better. And, the, and so that it, it, the world advances towards a duality, if you like. And of course, you know, it's, it, that can become incredibly dangerous if you identify those, that duality with particular things. And I, I was very pleased that you mentioned the thematic of Antichrist, because I think the idea of the counterfeit, of the double, the false, the false model, is an incredibly important part of apocalyptic. So that sort of discerning a possibly hidden enemy, you know, that, that sort of evil in disguise. Um, and when you think of things like, you know, the conspiracy theories today and the way we seem to be ever more wondering, you know, who is Trump? <laughs> you know, is, is he really a Russian? <laughs> and, and so I think this is still going on as well. I mean, I think, yes, there, there's the sense that apocalypse wavers between this desire for recuperation and redemption. But the, the standard leftist reading, you know, if you look at someone like what Zizek would say about apocalypse, is that it's just simply fundamentally politically disabling. It's a distraction. Looking at small-scale recuperative redemption living life in the ruins is a distraction from the necessary political action that needs to take place in the present because the game is not yet up. Um, planetary catastrophe can still be averted and the function of apocalypse um, I think it can it sort of so it goes between those, those two poles of the politically disabling and the yeah, well, we were saying before this, what you're saying is very interesting, we were talking about Zizek before this, it's, it's as if we've, we've all become totally politically disabled, but on the other hand, we love being voyeurs, so we're secretly fascinated by, by this whole idea. But I think, I think it's also the case that we're not wanting to look at the fact that, you know, avoiding an ecological catastrophe would mean a, a, a complete shift in our in our in our way of life, you know, in, in our in our fascination with um, th this. What has I argued is itself an apocalyptic project of endless growth and domination of nature, and and, and so it's almost easier to contemplate this horror 
and maybe imagine that we can get through it to the other side by a technological miracle, or even that sort of the post-human, rather like the divine, is going to save us, you know, that we, we've given up on ourselves, but we think maybe, you know, there'll be uh, a mutation beyond ourselves, which I think is a total fantasy, and in, in that sense I think Zizek's profoundly right. At the same time, I would say, I mean, I, I, I agree, but I, 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 my problem with the kind of sort of political attack on, um, on the apocalyptic imagination, what you described as the left-wing sort of mainstream reading, although I'm no longer quite sure where we would sort of want to position Zizek politically nowadays with, in relation to left and right, but uh, it's, uh, for me, it's, the problem with it sort of culturally is that it sort of simplifies and essentializes plots, and it kind of sort of doesn't really recognize the, the complexity of these plots and how they, how they, uh, how they interact with, with, with the sort of cultural um, given. Uh, I, don't, I had a um, quotation from the book you mentioned from um, um, the um, Staying with the Trouble, um, with Donna Haraway's book, the, um, where she's extremely, uh, um, if I can find it, she... Um, the story of species man as the agent of the Anthropocene is an almost laughable rerun of the great phallic humanizing and modernizing adventure where man, made in the image of a vanished god, takes on superpowers in his secular sacred ascent, only to end in tragic detumescence once again. Now that's very beautifully put, but I think it's, it's, a, sort of, it's a stark misrepresentation of what actually happens in these texts, especially now, sort of the, the sort of most recent, as I said, the, many of the most recent um, narrative fictions, post-apocalyptic fictions, are sort of looking at things like, um, like parenthood, a loss, and mourning, a sort of what it means for somebody, for a child to survive in in a, in a world without hope. They're sort of very, um, they're very subtle. I mean, they're not really sort of these big heterosexist wish fulfillment fantasies at all. So I think that that's from my, uh, from my perspective, that's what I what I find problematic about Zizek, um, that that he he kind of sort of not that he, I think he recognizes and he sort of identifies a particular kind of sort of um, function of a particular kind of block, apocalypse fiction, but he overlooks a lot of other things. Well, I, I think maybe one could justify what you're saying by saying that we need a happy medium between over and under representation. There's, there's a sense in which somebody like Benjamin, whom you're mm. talking about, who, who claims this is Jewish mysticism, I'm not sure whether it really is, but in a sense his mode of apocalyptic is almost too negative because he doesn't say what the future will be like. He only imagines it as a, a total rupture, a total mm. breaking in of, of something else. And this seems almost linked to political despair. But on the other hand, if you over-represent the ideal future, um, then, then you make too big a claims to a kind of blueprint. And so, so this is precisely where I think your literary stuff, in a sense, is in continuity with the religious imagination of sort of symbols of the future. And we, we need symbols of a hope, hopeful future. And we, you know, we can't just abandon the universal project. This is why I'm saying, in a sense, we can't get out of an apocalyptic framework without just going back to, you know, local villages. And so maybe that's what we hope with Brexit, but we're deluded. Um, so, so in a way, this is why I'm arguing that you need a sort of moderated apocalyptic, you know, in mm. that, trying to represent the good future I'm, I'm is important. I'm trying to moderate the apocalypse. Yes. Suzanne. Yeah. No, I was no, going to okay. say... You're, you're the moderate apocalypse. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank or you. moderator of, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I did want to come back to Benjamin yeah. because in some mm. sense I think the, the kind of continued kind of valency of that figure, the angel of history is almost that we're not quite done recuperating the ruins, brushing history against the grain, to find, you know, as Benjamin, mm -hmm. as Benjamin would say in the Arcase project, the kind of vestiges of imagined futures which never came to pass. And I'm thinking, I don't know if anyone here managed to get yeah, tickets to Angels in America. I didn't because it was sold out. But it's very interesting that this is now back at the National Theatre. And Angels of America is a, a play about the AIDS crisis, about Reagan coming to power. Um, and, you know, it absolutely picks on this trope of the angel of history. In fact, the angel kind of crashes through the ceiling at one point um, and tells um, the character who is dying from AIDS that we've got to stop history. 
we've got to reverse the engine. We have to restart the engine on a different track. And, you know, that, that idea of kind of looking for different futures in the sort of ruins of the past, I think is still very powerful. And, you know, and you see it in people like Sebold, um, Natural History of Disaster. And I, yeah. in a way, you're right. And I think there's a tension in, ben, in Walter Benjamin's reading of the angel that his friend... Gershom Sholem, who's an expert in Jewish mysticism, picks up and he says that angel is condemned to melancholia yeah. um, because there has to be the Messiah has to come out of nowhere and kind of bring about change and destruction. And Benjamin kind of wants that figure on the outside of history to be the sort of dialectical materialist historian and you know to take that godlike position so I, I do think you're right there is a certain sense of impotence to Benjamin's vision but I do think that it it has kind of inspired um, quite important kind of political projects representations yeah, the idea of hope and the fragments <laughs> yes. is more promising I think exactly yes. yeah. I think we should take some questions mm-hmm. from the audience sure. yes Do try and keep your questions short, please. Uh, yeah, um, uh, thanks for the discussion. I thought it was really interesting. Um, I thought everybody was maybe picking on the guy in the black jacket a bit too much. Um, but, but otherwise, I thought it was very interesting. Um, I'm interested, everybody seems to talk about um, ideas about repetition and about um, um, finding a way of, of kind of intermediating the guy in the grey jacket, I'm not sure what your name is, uh, said something uh, about trying to use religion uh, in order to stop the final an- answer. Um, but for me, the, what's most apocalyptic is sustaining antithesis. Um, that's, for me, that's, that's the worst thing that I can imagine. Um, so other people perhaps have different opinions. And should we take another one, Will? I'd like to hear some more about the idea of a moderated apocalyptic, which might help us to address the risks, which I think are very real, of the dangers of a bad apocalypse in our present time. You, we mentioned ap- uh, atomic weaponry. We've mentioned the possibilities of accelerated climate change. There's biopathogens that might be unleashed. There's our vulnerability to malware. There's the potential of crazy terrorists getting a hold of uh, even more weaponry than they've got in the past just because this information is available. So what can be done to uh, uh, respond to these threats? And I I accept that uh, just a... Asking people to be more liberal, more tolerant, more cosmopolitan, as I think you said at the beginning, uh, John, I, I don't think that's enough, and I think we need a, a bigger vision. So what, what is that vision? What, what, what can be done practically to help us uh, come through, I think, which is in reality a very dangerous time period? Mm. Thanks. Okay, so two questions there. One about how do we moderate the apocalypse or the apocalyptic, and the first one was about the necessity of sustaining antithesis. Or, yeah? Between what and what? I wasn't quite sure about that. Um, yeah, so if, if you, you can somehow that you can avoid um, the final answer by um, bringing sort of God back in uh, to the equation, um, which to, 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 I, I agreed with some of what you said, um, but, mm-hmm. but partly I think bringing, bringing religion back in just creates a situation and, uh, where you just sustain that kind of or, uh, that, 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 um, antithesis or you just deep put off the, the final answer. For me, the final answer would be um, a kind of, of heaven and sustaining antithesis and, and, and deferring the final answer is itself apocalyptic. So I believe we're living in an apocalyptic age. We're going through the apocalypse right now. Can we get out of it? Can we survive it? Can we climb out of it, perhaps? Thank you. Um, maybe just in response to that idea of sort of uh, reiteration and circularity, um, there, there is a, I, you just made me think of a very... Um, uh, I think very important essay by Martin Jay, by the, the, the cultural historian, where he, um, he, the question he addresses, it's a very short essay, and the question he addresses is why do the, key, why do the four horsemen keep coming back um, all the time and again and again? And, it's sort of, and he says there is a sort of um, a, a need, uh, he reads it psychoanalytically essentially as a kind of sort of acting out of, of a collective uh, uh, trauma, um, so it's post-apocalyptic in that sense, you know, the, 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 the traumatic experience is already with us and we're kind of sort of not able to find a solution. Um, but I think even if you don't read it psychoanalytically, that idea of a kind of sort of, um, of, of, of reiteration as a way of sort of 
working on our still um, pre-apocalyptic uh, condition here. I think that's a, that's a very interesting way of, of looking at it, uh, um, actually. Yeah. I mean, to kind of undercut what I and others have said, I mean, I'd like to quote um, or paraphrase uh, William Gibson. Uh, and say the apocalypse is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed yet. <laughs> and I think the, both the Anthropocene and the apocalypse is very parochial. It is the chattering of a liberal elite. Um, in my other work, I've just come back from doing some field work uh, on urban horticulture and urban gardening amongst, uh, in urban Pakistan, so in talking to people in Karachi, uh, trying to make a subsistence or livelihood under conditions of extreme insecurity, uh, extreme water shortage, and climate change is not going to help that. And you talk to these people and go, okay, well, there's a, uh, when the Himalayan glacier melts and the Indus kind of switches off in 30 years' time, it's going to be really bad. And you're talking to people who are living ex- in extreme urban precarity in the global south about a coming apocalypse, and I, that's not really an answer. It's more of a kind of gripe. Well, I, I mean, I, I thought these... Self-flagellation, maybe. I thought these two were re- really, really good questions. And... Um, If one thinks about climate change and even more about the question of nuclear weapons, um, it is as if we're in an apocalyptic situation because um, these are existential threats that can only be overcome if we sort of somehow contrive to leap to a, a level of universal human goodness that we haven't so far even remotely managed to get to. You know, it probably does require um, some kind of international politeia, not necessarily um, a world state, but nonetheless something international that can match, you know, international global corporate um, forces. And if anything, we seem to be um, backing off from that. Now, what, what's the relevance to that of... Um, talking about um, a mediated um, apocalyptic. Well, I, I, I think that the, 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 the whole point here is that um, to begin with, our, our sort of universal human projects, whether we're thinking about Greek, Greek philosophy, the religion of the Bible, or, or Buddhism and Confucianism and, and so on, were very much linked Um, to the idea that there is something objective um, beyond us which we're able to have some kind of deep um, approximate sense of without sort of gnostically thinking we've got hold of a whole secret or um, that tomorrow we can completely sort of realise this vision. And in that sense the the, the sort of great world religions held a certain kind of balance. And what I'm arguing is that when this gets imminentized, remember this is really gradual. Remember, even the French Revolution was a religious vision. You know, they still had a, a deistic kind of, of God um, and so on. But um, when you got the idea of a purely human project, the, the danger that... Um, you're saying that you have a universal blueprint um, uh, and that this is an ideology in the name of which you can extirpate everybody and everything who who disagrees with you is, I think, magnified. I also think it's significant that to begin with, um, this universal human project could only be given a kind of exciting, thick substance and feel by being made national. In other words, because it was also a French national project, it was associated with a whole style of living. And to some extent, France, what is exciting about France is that it still has that. But now it seems we've got a bifurcation, that either the universal human project is is sort of cold, abstract, empty, formalistic, or people are assisting on national identities that are are very, very um, atavistic. And my sense is that you can only sort of 
advance to a sort of thicker universal identity, if, if somehow we revive or we recover or, or we invent or something, something much more equivalent to these uh, religious traditions where you are claiming there's something beyond the human that we are mediating. Otherwise, if we're doing all the mediating, this almost inevitably um, tends to become sinister. The sense that there is something beyond us to which we're answerable and that we're approximating towards actually make, is what makes us critical as human beings. Sorry? Yeah. You can first. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to kind of put a sort of footnote to that very quickly, that in some ways... We do feel we are living in apocalyptic times, but the apocalypse is not here yet, actually. We are anticipating apocalypse. And perhaps we need to think less in terms of ideas and ideology, although in some ways that's my job, that's what I enjoy reading in books, and more in terms of sets of practices. So, for example, if you're living in the Blitz... Um, you know, there is a set of protocols. The alarm goes off. You kind of get ready for, yeah. for your house to be destroyed by a bomb. And maybe there are equivalents today in endlessly changing your passwords and going into every public building there. And so, in a way, the anticipation is no longer just something kind of ethereal, um, a thought. It's embedded we, we, in our kind of daily routine, in our, yes. our practices. So anticipation itself is an event. It's with us. And I don't know how, how that helps us kind of change the, you know, the, the threats that we face. It doesn't, but I do it's, think... It's it, the ritual dimension yeah. rather than this idea that yeah. it's just about... Uh, uh, isolated thoughts. It, it, it's kind of ritual that yeah. links thought to practice and mm-hmm. also means we don't fully understand what we're doing, but we feel it's important. Yeah. But it, Absolutely. It, it, there's a lot, there's a lot of the, the creation of the universal liberal individual abstracted from their world environment has very precisely brought about the Anthropocene. And at the very point in time when all the best current biological science knowledge is, is telling us that we are multi-species assemblages. We're not autonomous, rational individuals in charge of our own destiny. We could think about how algorithms are eroding what an individual, autonomy, autonomous individual might look like. At the very time when all the individual has been eroded by the challenge of the Anthropocene, is definitely not the time to then fall back on our old established inherited ways of thinking about what it is to be human. Well, you see, that's very interesting because I think, in a sense, for me, what you're saying, which actually is an answer to the dilemma that you describe, I mean, that, that we, we do have that sense of, of a distance um, that sep- of a sort of gulf that separates us from, you know, our actual experience and our hopes about a human future from what can be brought about and from our sense of agency. We have that. It's not perhaps for many of us a religious sense of, you know, being, of having to, to, sort of, to respond or sort of having to, uh, but, but it's, that, it, it's the sense of the Anthropocene as something which, yeah. which transcends and, 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 and in, entangles us. And so in that sense, for me, in, in, what you're describing as the sort of secular attitude towards apocalypse, um, you know, this sort of, fantasy and fear of human omnipotence, um, you know, the push-button officer, that actually seems to me sort of to be very much a very small parenthesis in, 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 in human culture, actually. It seems we're sort of moving away from that. And, uh, but we wouldn't, you know. we wouldn't have the Anthropocene um, at all were it not for the fact of this completely mysterious human dista- difference whereby we don't seem to be programmed in the same way as other things. So we've, we've done all sorts of different things culturally. We don't seem to be able to live as an animal without signs and without tools, despite the fact that biology has absolutely no way of explaining this at all. It makes no sense that I nature do. is having to take a detour between through culture that involves intentionality. And it's doubly mysterious, as people like Bernard Stiegler have described, the fact that signs and... Sorry, and, John, and I'm going to have I'll to just interrupt you. Tools. Well, just, it's a mutual determination, which is very hard to understand without 
invoking teleology. So I just but wouldn't not accept all this practice. biological stuff about I oh, want to sorry definition of John, John. I think it's rubbish. Enough. Um, I do want to fit in a couple more questions yeah. before we finish. I know there's a question here. There were also some over there from the beginning. Yeah, I was really interested in the sort of themes of uh, like conspiracy, hidden figures, um, mystery in creating fear. And I wondered what you thought about the idea that by formalizing visions of the apocalypse in a lot of the uh, works we've seen, film and things like that, are actually redemptive acts in themselves, um, either by forewarning or by uh, like perhaps allaying the existential fears. Thank you. And um, one more question over here. Um, yeah, I just, I was wondering, because you've been talking about a lot of different kind of examples of apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic narratives, but especially in reference to the conversation about f uh, ap apocalyptic films, I don't think the most famous or currently famous post-apocalyptic narratives like the Hunger Games or the Maze Runner trilogy or Divergent, those hugely popular um, blockbuster films and kind of I would like to, your comment on um, kind of how why those narratives are so popular and what kind of impact they might have potentially politically. Thanks. Thank you. So one about formalizing these kind of visions as a redemptive act in itself and the second one about these kind of blockbuster, apocalyptic blockbusters and why they're so appealing. Well, I think actually those two questions might link because in some ways apocalypse has always been something that you know, might be an elite thing understood by a secret society of initiates. Um, I think Joaquin de Fiore sees it in that way. Um, and on the other hand, it's this tremendously appealing popular trope. Um, and in some ways it's I think, well, certainly the thinkers that I think about find it very difficult to put those two things together. I mean, someone like D.H. Lawrence, for example, kind of rails in his book, The Apocalypse, against what he sees as a sort of populist Salvation Army version of Apocalypse, where everyone says, whoa, 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 um, Apocalypse is coming, the meek are going to rise. Um, so very Nietzschean. Very Nietzschean. Yes. It's absolutely Nietzschean, yeah, that the, the slave revolt is coming. Um, but... So you're right, Ben, in answer to your question, there is something in the sort of, um, I, I don't know, perhaps there is something in the kind of making open of these languages. And certainly, again, then to bring in another one, I think is HD, she has a very syncretic approach to lots of different, different sources. And one of the critics that I read said it was a bit like open source software. <laughs> you know, these kind of occult books are no longer closed. You know, you can take a bit from here, there, and everywhere and kind of, you know, come up with your own vision. So, so I think those, yeah, that's not specifically about the films, but I think they, the question of popular versus a kind of specialist apocalypse is very important. Yeah, I would join the two questions together and just pose the simple sort of test for any apocalypse, which is does it help us uh, attune to Earth forces and other earth creatures to which we are indebted. Does it help us understand our debts to and with those uh, non-human agencies? Okay, um, I think we'll finish on that the Hunger question. Games, no. <laughs> it doesn't. The Hunger Games is actually one, one thing that it's achieved already is it's, it's actually radically changed the sort of gender dynamics of apocalyptic narrative. It's sort of given us a wealth of female um, post-apocalyptic protagonists, which is in itself a fascinating, a fascinating thing. You know, it's much more f fruitful that than, the, than the conspiracy theories, which are essentially, I'd say, a sort of paranoia. It's a projection or externalization of fear. Okay, so panel ambivalence towards the Hunger Games. We'll finish on that then. Thanks very much for coming. <laughs>